We think of the beauty of this spring day. We remember the one, your son, who is making all things new one day in a new heavens and new earth. Help us to rest in the hope of his promise and the surety of his resurrection as we consider the grandeur of its implications for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the liberalism of the last century, professing Christians claimed that whether or not the bodily resurrection of Jesus happened didn't matter. As long as Jesus was raised in our hearts to live better lives, or as I once heard Rob Bell say at a talk, as long as Jesus was resurrected in some way to change the world. The classic rebuttal to this line of thinking was written by J. Gresham Machen, Christianity and Liberalism, what we're reading in our Pastors for Toll Now, actually. And Machen wonderfully and simply and clearly reminds us that the facts of redemptive history are inextricably tied to their doctrinal meaning. Machen said they're always combined in the Christian message, and he continued this in a statement that's since become somewhat well-known. He said, the narration of the facts is history. The narration of the facts with the meaning of the facts is doctrine. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. That is history. He loved me and gave himself for me. That is doctrine. History and doctrine. They're inseparable in sincere Christianity. Liberals attempted to separate the history from the doctrine, but often today we can be guilty of assuming the same divide as Christians defend the history and forget the doctrine. For example, C.S. Lewis in his Mere Christianity gives relatively little attention to Jesus' resurrection and what he claims is mere Christianity. If the resurrection's not mere, what is? And today, many popular evangelist, evangelistic presentations and tracts, if you pay attention, many of them give very little attention to the resurrection. And I've heard more than a few evangelistic presentations that don't even mention it at all. See, we can face a different issue than liberalism. We know the resurrection is historically true, but why does it matter? Does it mean anything? Is it only a historic aside to our faith, or does it have a doctrinal weight, a centrality to our faith and practice? And the reformer John Knox said the resurrection is the chief article of our faith. And he was right, and we should know why. So to understand the centrality of the resurrection, I want us to consider five components of how it is fundamental to our faith and practice. I want us to consider who we worship, how we worship, when we worship, why we worship, and the ministry of the church, and how it's all rooted in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Let's consider first who we worship Christ the Lord. Now, the resurrection identifies who we worship. Who raised Jesus from the grave? Jesus did. In the Gospel of John, Jesus declared in chapter 2, verse 19, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. And he referred to the temple of his body. Later in John 10, verses 17 and 18, the Lord Jesus said this, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I've received from my Father. Even here in Romans 1, we have Paul declaring in verse 4, Jesus was declared to be the Son of God of power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Now there's a significant consensus in interpretive history, past and present, that we ought to understand the spirit of holiness, which the ESV here capitalizes, referring to the Holy Spirit, closer to the Greek text, which is literally a spirit of holiness a reference to Christ's divine nature. 
And that makes sense if you consider verse 3, the parallel Paul uses here. He's setting against Jesus' descent according to the flesh, that is according to his human nature. And verse 4, his resurrection according to the spirit of holiness, his divine nature. So Matthew Poole, for example, in the 17th century said, others more rightly understand here the deity and divine nature of Christ. Jesus told Martha in John 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. It's him. He raised himself from the dead. One theologian said, the son by his own divine power re-quickened his human body. Now, Scripture also attributes the resurrection to God the Father. In Ephesians 1, verse 19, we read the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And Scripture also attributes the resurrection to the Holy Spirit. In Romans 8, 11, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. There is one God. There is one will in God because there's one God. The work of God is attributed to Father, Son, and Spirit. Then what that must mean is that Father, Son, and Spirit are the three subsistences or persons in which the one God exists. And so because the resurrection is attributed to the Son, the Father, and the Spirit, then God must be triune. And his works, we say, are undivided. Charles Hodge put it this way, he said the three persons of the Godhead being the same in substance, the act of the one is the act of the others. Any external act that is in anything God does in creation is an act of the Godhead and may be referred to either of the divine persons. Or if Charles Hodge is too heady for you, try Shai Lin. Father, Son, and Spirit, three and yet one, working as a unit, to get things done. A triune eternal bond no one could ever sever when it comes to the church, peep how they work together. So on one end, we say, opera trinitatis ad extra indivisisunt. And on the other end, we say, a triune eternal bond no one could ever sever, peep how they work together. You can pick Latin or Shai Lin, they're saying the same thing. Who raised the sun? God the Father, God the Son, or God the Spirit? Yes. And so, if Jesus raised himself, verse 4, the resurrection declares him to be who? God. The Son of God. No mere man, but proven to be God the Son. The God-man. God-man for us. The Puritan Thomas Boston reflected on it this way. He said, if Jesus had remained in the grave, it would be reasonable to believe him only an ordinary man and that his death was the just punishment of his presumption to call himself the son of God. Now, Jesus did claim to be God. He said he would build his assembly. God builds his assembly. God builds his church. That's a divine claim. He said in John 8, before Abraham was, I am. He claimed a man walking around to be the I am who I am of the burning bush. That is either the height of blasphemy worthy of death, or it's a bottomless wonder. And the resurrection proved it's just that, the latter. His grave was empty, So truly in Jesus Christ, as Paul says in Colossians 2, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Godness dwells in the flesh. And his suffering on the cross and his dying on behalf of sinners and rising again, uh, Gerhardus Voss says, is the irrefutable proof of his divine nature. Listen to his reasoning here. It's wonderful. He said, the fact that Christ bore eternal death which is what he suffered on the cross. Not eternal in time, but eternal in judgment. The fact that he bore eternal death without succumbing in that struggle is irrefutable proof of his divine nature. A mere creature would be swallowed up by that death and would never again be able to hold his head high. He, in contrast, could not be held by that death. 
Our God is a consuming fire for any man to come under his wrath would to be consumed, and yet he endured and rose again, proving him to be God the Son. Later in Romans, many of us probably know that Paul summarizes the Christian life in chapter 10, the basic Christian confession as this in verse 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believed in your heart, what? That God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We confess Christ is Yahweh, is Lord, God himself, because we believe God raised him from the dead. And upon that confession, you are baptized into the name singular of the Father and of the Son and of the Spirit. Because God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. The resurrection demonstrates who we worship. Our triune God, Christ the Lord. And secondly, the resurrection is rooted when we worship. On the Lord's day. Our worship on Sundays is as old as the first Sunday evening when our risen Savior appeared to his disciples. It's striking and remarkable. The Gospels and the Gospel authors seem totally unconcerned with chronological detail and at times even moving things around according to their themes. But they take pains When it comes to the resurrection in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to tell us it's the first day of the week. In John 20, the first day of the week. Luke 24, on the first day of the week. Why were the authors, the evangelists of the Gospels, so concerned to demonstrate that? Because that's when the church met. And they were explaining and reminding and teaching us why we do so. In 1 Corinthians 16, Paul writes to Corinth about his impending visit to the collect for the poor, and we read, on the first day of every week, as I've directed the other churches, assuming that's when they gather. It's a regular gathering the first day of every week. Or in Acts 20, verse 7, when Paul stops on Troas in his final journey to Jerusalem, he says, on the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread. A formal gathering and the breaking of bread, likely a reference to the celebration of the Lord's Supper. The church has always gathered on the first day of the week in the joy of the fulfillment of God's promises with the resurrection of Jesus. The Lord finished all his work on the seventh day in creation and rested. The Lord finished all his saving work in Christ on the seventh day and he was in the grave and rose again that in the new covenant the day of rest and worship would be the first day of the week not the last because we no longer look forward we look backward not in what is promised but in what has been accomplished that's why we call it the Lord's day the early church called it the day of the resurrection not just Easter every week is the day of the resurrection. Memorably, B.B. Warfield said this, I love this expression, Christ took the Sabbath into the grave with him and brought the Lord's day out of the grave with him on the resurrection morning. Every Sunday's Easter. For too many Christians, the why and when the church meets are open questions. Churches meet on Saturday nights. What were the disciples doing Saturday night? Grieving and hopelessness. Why would you meet on an evening of grief? We gather on the day of life, of the resurrection, the Lord's day. And beloved, the very calendar we keep is a confession that Jesus rose from the grave on the first day of the week. And we only come to God by the risen Lord Jesus, so we gather on the day he was raised to bring us into his presence. Thirdly, we see not only who we worship and when, but how we worship established by the resurrection. How we worship according to Scripture. Our God is simple. He's uncomposed, not made of parts. So God the Son is simple. And God the Son incarnate could then say in John 14, I am the truth. Not I have it, I define it. Jesus is the standard, the archetype, 
of truth. And that claim is proved by his resurrection from the dead. He is truth incarnate. That means that all that Jesus taught is true. And all that is spoken of Jesus is true. In light of the resurrection, theologian Charles Hodge again wrote simply, therefore, the Bible is true from Genesis to Revelation. Why is the Bible true? Because the tomb is empty. Jesus is therefore the superintendent of its writing. Peter, in 1 Peter 1.11, says the Old Testament prophets were inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating. Who animated and superintended the writings of the Old Testament prophets? The Spirit of Jesus. He rose from the dead, so it was his Spirit who promised his coming. And anticipating his resurrection, Jesus said to those who would author the New Testament, John 16, 13, his disciples, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Jesus' resurrection proves the whole Bible's read. From Genesis to Revelation is the word of Christ. He, his spirit superintended the writing of the Old Testament. His spirit superintended the writing of the New. But he not only superintended Scripture, he's its subject. John 5, 46, Jesus told the Pharisees, if you believed Moses, you would believe me because he wrote of me. And in Luke 24, he says the topic of the Old Testament is his death and resurrection. Verse 44, Jesus told his disciples, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. What did the author of the Old Testament say the Old Testament is about? That the Christ should suffer and rise from the dead. And that then is the model we see in the preaching of the apostles. That scripture is true and it's about the truth because Jesus rose from the grave. In Acts 17, Paul goes to Thessalonica. And according to his custom, Luke writes this, Paul went in the synagogue as was his custom and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures. That would for us be the Old Testament. Explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. Just what Jesus said. Paul was teaching the Jews in the synagogues how to read the Bible properly as Christian scripture because Christ rose from the dead. But Luke goes on in Acts 17, far more noble-minded than those Thessalonians were the Bereans. And in verse 11, we're told they received the word, Paul's preaching, with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. What were the Bereans receiving with joy and eagerly studying in Scripture to confirm? That Christ rose from the grave and is the Savior, the Old Testament promise. So, according to early particular Baptist Nehemiah Cox, he said this, In all our search after God's mind in Holy Scripture, we are to manage our inquiries with reference to Christ. That is to say, every time you open your Old Testament, every time you open the Bible, you're always thinking about Jesus. He is its author. He is its subject. How do you know he rose from the dead? It's about him. The resurrection drives that we read and hear the Bible, and the resurrection drives how we do it. We not only hold it as true, we interpret it in reference to the truth. Its source, the Lord Jesus Christ, because he's risen. And then that brings us, fourthly, to why we worship. The resurrection demonstrates we worship Christ the Lord on the Lord's day, according to his word, and fourthly, for the assurance of our salvation. Why would we come to worship? Because God has brought us into his presence. Remember what we considered last week from Isaiah 50, verse 8, the servant song, he who vindicates me is near. The servant God sent to redeem his people would be vindicated by him. But how? By the resurrection. 
By his resurrection, we confess in 1 Timothy 3.16, he was vindicated by the Spirit. And that's an early church confession in reference to Jesus' resurrection, his vindication according to the Spirit's power. Because with his accursed death, his obedient life demanded vindication. And it was by the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. In a word, the resurrection justified Jesus. The ground of Jesus' resurrection was his righteousness. He did not deserve to die. So the resurrection, as we read in Romans 1.4, declares him to be the Son of God, to be righteous. And so therefore, if the resurrection justifies Jesus, then the resurrection is the ground of our being declared righteous in Jesus. That's why Romans 4.25 says he was raised for our justification. Because the act that justifies him justifies everyone who is united to him by faith. Listen to this connection again by Gerhardus Voss. He explains this and says there's a causal connection between the justification of Christ and those who belong to him. And he goes on to say, what comes to pass with the individual believer in his justification is nothing other than the personal realization of the justification of Jesus. When you are justified, Jesus' justification is yours. And so we sing that he is vindicated by the resurrection of dead, the dead because that means if you're in him, so are you. He's righteous and his righteousness is yours. Or we could think of the great compiler of the Heidelberg Catechism, Caspar Olivianus, 16th century theologian. You can remember Caspar, Caspar the friendly German. Yeah. Not all Germans are friendly, I can tell you. Caspar was friendly. He says this. Listen to the reasoning. It's beautiful. I couldn't improve on it, so I just want to read it. Christ's resurrection is our righteousness. Because God further regards us in the perfection in which Christ rose. Whereas the Father regarded us previously, in the dying Son as sinners, He sees us now in the resurrected Son as righteous. Or rather, where He previously regarded the Son in our sins as a sinner, He regards Him now and us in Him as the person which He is, and which he is not for himself, but for us. Now that's wonderful. The Father regarded us previously as sinners on the cross. Jesus suffering our judgment. And so now in his risen life, he regards us as he regards Jesus as righteous. As he previously regarded Jesus on the cross as a sinner, he regards him now as righteous and us in him the person which he is. What's your assurance that you're right with God, dear Christian? Or when you encourage a faint-hearted brother or sister, where do you point them? First, the empty tomb. If the grave is empty, he is righteous, and so are you. That's the simple truth of the gospel. If the grave is empty, then so are the accusations of the evil one and our own fears of condemnation. Christians are garrisoned against every doubt by this certain fact. Christ was justified by being raised from the dead. So if you have faith in him, you are justified in him alone. We worship because God has brought us to himself in his presence by the risen Lord Jesus, who justifies us by his own justification. And that brings us then fifthly and finally to our mission, why we go into the world. The resurrection is the foundation of our mission to the world. Or as one theologian said, the resurrection gives the imperative to gospel preaching, the urgency why is there an urgency to our ministry and an endurance for it? 
the resurrection of Jesus. What did Peter preach to the Jews in Jerusalem in Acts 2? In verse 32, he said, This Jesus God raised up. And of that we are all witnesses. And then he went on in verse 36 and said, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. That is Romans 4. He's declared to be the Son of God because he's been raised from the dead. And so what's the therefore? Verse 38, repent and be baptized because Jesus is risen from the grave. Or later in Athens, to the pagans, to the Gentiles, Paul preached in Acts 17, verses 30 and 31, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, and that covers everyone on the planet if you're wondering, God's call to you is repent and turn to Christ. Why? He's risen from the grave. He's been made and demonstrated both Lord and Christ by his resurrection. One great way to provoke this thought in others simply in conversation is just to ask them, hey, what do you think Jesus is doing now? Be careful not to only talk about our Lord and Savior in the past tense because he's not past. He's risen again. So he is presently reigning and is one day returning. And so it's totally acceptable to consider What is Jesus doing now? There is no was for him like there are for other departed people. There is only now. He is risen from the grave. And we remind our world that way, that yes, there is a right side to history. The world will be judged in righteousness, but it is the risen Lord who determines who's on that side. Here's the truth. Because Jesus was justified by his resurrection, you must either be justified by faith in him or be judged by him. And those are the only two options. We are justified by faith in Christ or judged by him who received the authority to do so. And both of those are founded on the fact that the tomb was empty Sunday morning and Jesus rose from the grave. The resurrection drives our mission of good news. The resurrection drives our mission of warning and of coming judgment. And the resurrection establishes the mission of the church as inherently forward and future oriented. And we heard this morning, again helpfully, in 1 Corinthians 15, that if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are, Paul says in verse 19, pitiable, Verse 17, our faith is futile, and our existence is so empty that verse 32, we can say, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die, and there is nothing. And that means the ministry of the church, whether to our community or to our members, can never be reduced to what our age calls useful. Now, we can become obsessed, mostly because we're Americans, but we're obsessed with pragmatic things, being useful to others. What practical value does your church offer to the community, pastor? None. Are we here to fix social problems? Nope. Are we here to address the current political turmoil? Nope. Then what in the world are you doing? Reminding you of the man who will. Well, how do you know that? He rose from the grave. That's why we're here, and that's what we're doing. Reminding everyone who will fix everything and make all things new because he rose from the grave. And we declare the reality of it, not just retributively in judgment, but remind everyone curatively in hope. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20, we're told, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of of those who have fallen asleep. In the Old Testament, when you brought your first fruits as an offering, it was a part that represented the whole. 
You were acknowledging that your, your whole crop, your whole harvest came from the Lord. And you were giving it as an offering, as a reminder to yourself and a declaration to others that you understood that. So Jesus' resurrection as the first fruits means it's a part that is connected and represents the whole. He is, as Paul says in Romans 8, 29, the firstborn of many brothers. Jesus is the pledge that all departed saints will be raised and be like him. And this is our encouragement In 1 Thessalonians 4.14, Paul writes this, Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. And then he ends that paragraph in verse 18 and says simply, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. I texted with our sister Beth this afternoon. She said she's had a stream of visitors and that she's so encouraged by our church family, her words. And that's so true. Our church is encouraging, and there's countless ways it is. And as we serve one another in the ailments of life and griefs of life and unplanned trips to the hospital, we bring prayer, we bring meals, and we bring words. And most basically, our word is this. Since Jesus rose again, everyone who belongs to him will too. You will rise with Jesus. And you can say that to every Christian. Our ministry to our community, our ministry to our own members, is always future-oriented. It's a spiritual mission. We preach and we teach and we counsel and we encourage that because the grave is empty, hope is not. There is life to come. A couple of years ago, the president of Union Theological Seminaries, long gone the way of liberalism, did an interview with the New York Times, and in it she said this, for me, the message of Easter is that love is stronger than life or death. There's a much more awesome claim than that they put Jesus in the tomb and three days later he wasn't there. For Christians for whom the physical resurrection becomes a sort of obsession, That seems to me a pretty wobbly faith. What if tomorrow someone found the body of Jesus still in the tomb? Would that mean then that Christianity was a lie? No, faith is stronger than that. You don't have to worry about someone finding Jesus' body tomorrow. But secondly, the answer, of course, is that if they theoretically found Jesus' body, yes, it is a lie. And... No worship, no Bible, no message, no hope for ourselves or others. We can all go home, pour ourselves a drink, grab a bite, and wait to die because that's it. But they will find no body. Charles Hodge, one last time, said, It may be safely asserted that the resurrection of Christ is at once the most important and the best authenticated fact in the history of the world attested by multiple eyewitnesses and occurring as it was written and promised thousands of years before, the facts of history and the testimony of Scripture cry, He is risen. And so, in our worship, in our ministry, in our gathering on the Lord's Day, in our studying and teaching the Bible, in our evangelism, and in our encouragement All we are simply saying is he is risen indeed. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the hope of tomorrow that is ours today because of the resurrection of your Son. And we thank you for this day set apart to meditate and to commune with you in the hope of the resurrection. And we pray that even this meditation this evening would encourage our hearts for this week ahead to hope ourselves and to hold out to others that there is hope in this life because your son has conquered death and so will everyone who is found in him. Father, help us encourage one another with these words and to evangelize the lost with the same that many more would hold fast in the face of the difficulties of life with this simple truth, the grave is empty and so our faith and hope are not. We praise you and thank you for our Lord Jesus. Amen.